Are we ready? Yeah, okay. Okay, folks, today I'm really excited. We've got three amazing groups. We've been talking about youth sports, uh, activism, youth-driven learning, uh, work in our communities, and I think that all these different groups today are gonna exemplify that. But before we get to the individual groups, we're gonna kick it off today with Dr. Scott Brooks. And I'm so excited that, that Scott's here today. He's got an amazing story. Um, part of which is that he is an alumnus from Cal State University East Bay from the sociology department, okay? That's Carl Stemple over there, sociology. Uh, so it's great to have Scott back. Since Cal State East Bay, he's gone from strength to strength. He's done some amazing work. And he's currently at Arizona State University. He's with the Global Sport Institute. He's the director of research, okay? And they've got an amazing center down there. They had a wonderful event a couple weeks ago, which I heard from Scott went really well. Um, let me just give you a little bit more background about Dr. Brooks here. He's been quoted and reviewed by major, major media outlets like the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Washington Post, and Slam Magazine, okay? Um, his book, Black Men Can't Shoot, with in a, a very top quality university academic press, University of Chicago, okay, talks about the importance of exposure networks and opportunities for young people playing sports to obtain athletic scholarships, okay? So I recommend for my students, if you can, have a look at that book. It's a great resource. He's also consulted with uh, professional sports organizations, the NFL, Major League Baseball, uh, college programs, high school programs, and also athletes. Um, and he's even busier. He's also a senior fellow at the Wharton Sports Business Initiative, and he's connected with Yale Urban Ethnography Project. Um, so again, he's very, very active as a researcher, but very plugged into uh, the communities and the programs and projects around him. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really proud that we've got Scott here today. Um, as well as his mother-in-law who came today, Miotis over there. Um, great that, he, that he's got a family connection in the Bay Area. Okay, so just a little bit about the format today. Scott's gonna kick it off, he's the opening speaker. When Scott's finished, then he's gonna turn it over. We're gonna hear from Ben Gucciardi with Sock Without Borders. Then after Ben speaks, um, we'll hear from Kim Woozy and Ashley Masters, the leaders of Skate Like a Girl in the San Francisco region, okay? And then Danya Cabello with Footballistas for Life. They made a wonderful documentary about a group of students in Fruitvale that grassroots movement to build their own local soccer field, okay, and is featured in documentary. And she's on the way, she's in traffic, but uh, she'll be here, I'm sure. Um, so without further ado, I wanna turn it over to Scott, let Scott kind of kick things off. So please give a big hand, folks, for Dr. Scott Brooks. Thank you, Scott. All right, uh, good afternoon, or good evening. Come on, let's try it again. Good afternoon. All right, so, I think I'll, I'll show you a little bit about our institute. We're pretty new. Um, it's, a, it's a dream job, so I'd like to share it. Let me see. The goal of Global Sport Institute is really to make the people in sport better, to make sport itself better, and to make the world better as a result, not just to do research for research's sake, but to think about how can we deliver information to all the parties involved in sport that is positively impactful, but also will impact the world. We're going to come together and start thinking intellectually and philosophically and practically about sports and its future. Sports has an ability to transcend culture, transcend religion, transcend gender. It's just a place where shared communities come together for a single purpose. What we know is sports from huge global events like the Olympics, like the World Cup, it brings all of these people together. And so it allows us a, an opportunity to see how small the world is, how alike, how similar we are, and yet how we're, we're going through this, this journey together. For us to be able to attack the issues of sport in a constructive way requires many teams made up of many different disciplines 
So what ASU does really well is naturally brings people across disciplines to have a sense of appreciation of the problem and then a desire to want to solve the problem as a team. So as the Global Sport Institute was being planned, the university stepped up at the highest level and provided its support. Also stepping in was the athletic department in a unique way that has not been done before. And then the final step was a global brand, Adidas, already a university partner, stepping up and saying, we want to be a part of this as well. And they provided support in an area that apparel companies have never stepped into before. And here we are again, finding a way to be an innovator, be the first in you know, the country, possibly the world, to really engage sport at this kind of level, scholarly, seriously, as well as a way that's going to be practical. What information do people need? So should your kid play football with a concussion? What are the chances of your kid being a professional athlete? Should you fund the new stadium in your city? Should you drink Gatorade instead of water? But for society too, there are questions like, why aren't more Latino girls participating in sport? Many times sports are actually ahead of the curve on examining critical issues. And we've seen that historically, right? When Catherine Switzer was the first woman to defiantly run the Boston Marathon, we saw that sports could be a wonderful arena for pushing against traditional gender role stereotypes. Whether that's equal pay for women, or activism, or integration, a lot of times you see that sports takes on the issues before they become mainstream. We're looking at the future of sports. So what, what is there that we should look at that's going to improve sport and improve the people in it? What new inventions might come about? And what can we support? What can we inspire to be developed? That's what ASU is really good at, innovation at scale. So let's move those value propositions, those new products, those new services, those new ways to impact the world of sport out into the world so that hundreds, thousands, millions, if not billions of people can benefit from that aha moment that happens in the lab. So the, the broad base of the impact that sport can have, apart from the enjoyment that comes from, from watching the games, uh, is it, something that we, we take for granted. And an institute of this nature will understand more deeply what's going on and how to make it even more positively impactful. So, and I'll tell you a little bit um, about what I get to do there on a daily basis. So I'm a sociologist, a uh, professor at ASU, I'm just finishing up my second year there. But I... Sorry about that. Uh, finishing up my second year there, but I've been at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, as well as at the University of Missouri. So this is a dream for anybody who does research because this is more than half of my job, is to literally think about what things can we study as it pertains to sport. And then I get the opportunity of deciding what, what research projects we fund. I get to hire undergraduates. I get to hire graduate students. So to show you this is really a pitch at when you're thinking about graduate school, right, ASU is a great place to go. If you're interested in sport, not only can you go and decide you want to pursue your master's or your doctorate, but you can holler at me. Come see me and see, say, hey, Brooks, I heard you talk at Cal State East Bay. I'd like to be involved. So I pay people as undergraduates and graduate students to do research, right? So right now, one of the projects that we're working on is this athlete activism. It's been very hot for the last couple of years. So we're trying to take a real extensive look and, and uncover some things that people haven't talked about. All right, so I wanna tell you a little bit about how I got started in all this. I'm originally from East Oakland, right above Nolan Park, and I attended Bishop O'Dowd High School. Um, all of my, I've got, we call this our family school. We go back to when this was Cal State Hayward, my mother attended Cal State Hayward. My uncle, my cousin, who's my best friend, attended Cal State Hayward. As, as uh, Matt told you, I attended Cal State Hayward for my master's. My father-in-law attended Cal State Hayward for his master's. So this is our school, right? Coming here looks very different. I used to live right above campus. We'd go work full time and then come down here for, for classes in sociology. Right before you were here, Carl, right? Yeah, we just missed each other. Okay, towards the end. 
I don't know if it was a pleasure, but yes, <laughs> we just missed each other. But in high school, you know, we had some, some battles here on campus. Uh, what I mean is as a basketball player, I went going to Bishop O'Dowd. It's a pretty small school. Jason Kidd was playing at the same time as St. Joe's and our gyms were too small. So we played here. I got stitches above the eye here from one of those battles but it was a great time thinking of Cal State East Bay. And so in high school was when my sociology career basically began. I was senior, co-captain of the team. I didn't play as much as I thought I should, which is probably the case. How many of y'all played high school sports, anything in sport? Any of you felt like you should have played more, right? Okay, so I was one of those, those people. Um, I had a couple of small looks um, from colleges, could have attended and played small D3, but I wasn't happy during the season. And I am a qualitative researcher. So when my coach would, after the games, you all remember when your coach would go through the stat sheet? Okay, so I had problems with the coach going through the stat sheet and then telling me and other teammates that we weren't cutting it. You're not rebounding enough. You don't score well enough. You miss free throws. And I thought that what was missing was what decisions the coach was making, right? So I'm thinking about, I didn't have a whole lot of opportunities to shoot. When we're in the game, you call plays for only certain people, right? So I started to think about these things deep. Then I thought about some other things. When I took a look at the stat sheet, so you give someone like me too much information and it's trouble for you. So I took all these stat sheets and I thought about playing against Piedmont High. How many of you know Piedmont High? Okay. Then I looked at Ojai when we play Oakland High. Then I thought, okay, well, wait, now let me look at Alameda High. Let me look at Castlemont. Let me look at St. Mary's. And now I found some trends. When we played the white schools, Piedmont and Alameda, the white guys played a lot. But when we played the black schools and public schools, the black guys played a whole lot. So I had an additional question. So coach, how do you explain this? Right, this is me as a 17, 18 year old. Our coach had won over 500 games. How do you explain this coach? And he didn't have an answer for me. And that was the beginning of me saying, you know, there's some deeper questions when we look at stats. You can't just look at the numbers. You got to look within the numbers. You got to see what's going on inside of a team. And so I ask those same kind of questions today. When we're looking at sports teams, is what we are seeing really what's going on? When a Kobe Bryant scores 81 points, we get the highlights on ESPN. Kobe Bryant is, for some people, the greatest of all time. But when I study that 81-point game, I look at everyone but Kobe. Because Kobe doesn't score 81 points because of Kobe. When you go back and look at that stat sheet, Kobe only had six rebounds. How do you get to take over 40 shots if you only grab six rebounds? How many shots do other people take? Nobody else took over 14 shots. So how does Kobe score 81? Terrible defense. Played the Toronto Raptors. They were one of the worst defensive teams that year. The referees are calling calls. Yeah, maybe some of them were good calls, but some of them were terrible calls. His teammates pass it to him even when they could shoot. I mean, that's kind of like an obvious thing, but think about it. To be a star player, others have to treat you like a star player. They have to defer. They have to literally give you the ball when they can take their own shot. Now, coaches influence that. What does a coach do if a coach doesn't want you to shoot? What does a coach do if they don't want you to shoot? Right? They may tell you don't shoot. They'll tell you to pass the ball. What else might they do? They might put you in a different position. Y'all are all really nice. My coach would just say, sub, get them out. So you learn the rules, right? You learn, are you supposed to shoot or not shoot? Are you so, what are you supposed to do based upon what your teammates do, how they treat you, how your coach treats you? Again, this is going on within the numbers. 
So you could just look and think that person is a great player, but I'm telling you it's about the collective action. It's about the whole group. It's about what everybody is doing to make that performance happen. So that's a qualitative sociological look. And that's what I do personally in my research. I study teams. I only write pretty much. I've only, I've written 90% of my work is about basketball. That's all that I write about. Nobody tells me what to write about. I get to pick. And that's why I love my job as a professor, as a sociologist. Because I have all that freedom to do that. So in this year at the Institute, and our focus has been on race, every year we have a different theme. Last year it was on technology. This year it was on race. Last year we even had um, people, one scientist in engineering is trying to figure out transformable shoes. He wants to create the shoes that when you go from running on the sidewalk, onto gravel, onto grass, the shoe will literally transform and adjust to the different terrain. Now, he's not all that far yet. He's looking at how your ankle works so that he can make sure it does the right absorption and so on. But we're funding a second year of his research on that. Right. That's just an example from last year. Right. And so this year it's on race. I've got people who are studying everything from roller derby. There's a new upstart in roller derby as a very popular sport. And one of the things that that this person found was that there is a team indigenous. So a native team that does not get to practice. They are indigenous on all continents. And they only come together for global tournaments, right? And so we're funding that kind of research. Next year, our theme is on the body. Everything from doping to concussions. Castor Semenya, the great South African uh, woman sprinter who is being questioned for her gender because she has high rates of testosterone, right? She's not doing any doping. She's not doing anything unnatural, but she has higher than average rates of testosterone. So the question is, does she have an unfair advantage? And so we are studying and researching this, all right? We are looking at a trans athlete. We're looking at a trans woman who competed in a marathon as a, tra as a man and has now gone through uh, her hormonal therapy as well as her psycho, uh, psycho, psycho, psychological, social psychological therapy and training and is now trying to run as a woman. And in that, we're looking at, is there an unfair advantage? These are these deep questions in sport. I'll give you a, a little bit of a teaser. What we have found is that there isn't an unfair advantage. That when you go through the hormonal therapy, right, and her body changes, it has changed at such a rate that it has not created an advantage, not anything consistent. So, yes, she had a great performance in one uh, run, one marathon, but over the course of a few different runs, it has panned out, it is leveled out, right? So these are some of the important questions that we are thinking about in sports. When it comes to youth, Right. So again, I started thinking about these in high school. But what I'm really pushing now is when I meet with leagues and they start to talk about what they want to do with youth, you're seeing the same things that you see on television during the Warriors game. That Kevin Durant went to, uh, you know, the boys club down in the numbers in Oakland and passed out basketballs and gave a clinic. And I'm telling them that's not enough. That what we need is not basketballs, because nobody can eat off of basketballs. And not how many people are going to become NBA players. I would say WNBA players, but they don't make anywhere near the same amount. So I'm not trying to discredit them. They put in the same work and have the same amount of skills. But usually they have to do a second shift, as we call it. They work in Europe, making additional money. Because on average, while an NBA career is somewhere around five million, right? That's a veteran minimum and an average per year. On the WNBA level, how many anyone know what the average WNBA salary is? It's less than a hundred thousand. So we've got a lot of gaps to cover. Right? But in this, what it is, we are trying to do is provide opportunities for youth 
that go beyond just thinking about participating. So I am pushing them that if you are the Warriors, what I want you to do is when you do a fundraiser, go to communities, particularly communities of color, and have these young folks that you would give a basketball clinic to teach them how to do a fundraiser. Let them learn your job so that they can go back in their communities and learn marketing or, do, or show that they have marketing skills. Take general managers down there. Let them see what it is like to be a general manager. College coaches, and you look at a football college coach or a basketball college coach, some of them are making $7 million a year. The average MBA career is only about three years, three and a half years. But a coaching career can be 20 or 30. I'll take my little five mil for 20 or 30 years. Take it. So we need to expose youth to all the jobs besides the athlete jobs. We need these organizations who are saying that they're investing in us to invest in not only the exposure, but giving us internships and opportunities. Because hope, right, and even though that's a real abstract thing, is something that gives us a lot to look forward to. Because it was hope, right, in the midst of me being upset, I eventually quit my high school team as co-captain. I felt like I got sour, I got upset, I wasn't the best me, I wasn't a good teammate, and I knew that this coach was not changing. I said to him, the thing that I was lucky, that made me lucky, was I had already gotten into Cal, I had already gotten into Georgetown, I knew I was going to a place for school. And I said to him, I don't know that you will do the right thing by the rest of my teammates who don't have their grades in order. And that was a problem for me. I don't need you, is what I told him. I'm going to be okay. But it was that fire, right? That fire that kept me going. I study sport because of that bad experience. That's why I care about what goes on inside teams. That's what I'm still studying over 25 years later is because I got that passion. Because I had a vision that there was something else. And I had that vision because of people like Harry Edwards, right, who was a sociologist from Berkeley, has studied, was the, the thinker behind the Black Power Fist, the pop Black Power Movement in the Olympics in 1968. That was a professor. He was a professor at Berkeley, and he's one of my mentors. I saw him growing up because he was on the sidelines with the 49ers. He was on the sidelines until the last 10 years. He still works for the 49ers. And that gave me the hope. I knew I could study sport just like Harry Edwards studied sport. And my goal was to make it better for kids. I didn't want any other kid to go through what it was I went through. Right. So I just want to give you those words as an opening. And we've got wonderful guests here that we're going to continue to have conversations with. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And I saw a lot of heads nodding on the panel when you talked about hope and, and passion and motivation for collective action and grassroots action in our communities. And I think you've set that up really nicely with a lot of critical questions about race and gender and, and social class and sexuality in our local communities. And I know that the next uh, three groups that are going to be speaking will directly talk to those issues. I know them well, and I think that will they will pick right up on those themes. So thank you very much, Scott. That was awesome. The next group um, that will be featured is Sock Without Borders. I know this group well. I was at their practice last night in Oakland. Thank you very much, Ben. I called Ben and said, I'm in the neighborhood. Can I go down to practice? And I had a wonderful time. Um, and, and Ben Gucciardi, what really impressed me about this program is this came out of one of his uh, master's degree projects um, that he was working on in education. And I think that's a great thing for you to think about is that the project that he's gonna describe, which is based in Oakland, but it's global, was something that he was working on in the classroom. And I love the way that he's translated that out into practice. And now it has been uh, won numerous awards from FIFA, uh, the White House and the previous administration recognize Stock Without Borders. 
uh, and they're going from strength to strength. And I, I, and I really am great to see Ben here, and I'm going to turn it over to, to Ben. He'll talk more about his program, um, and we'll go from there. So hi, everybody. My name is, my name is Ben Gucciardi. Thank you so much for coming out. And um, I'm going to talk to you all about uh, Soccer Without Borders, which is an organization I started in 2006, uh, which is 14 years ago. It's kind of crazy. I did not anticipate I would still be doing that 14 years later. Uh, but just by way of framing, I think Scott talked a little bit about uh, one aspect of, of how sport intersects with social issues. Um, and I think the next, the next presenters are going to talk a little bit more specifically about how sports is being used with, with youth in the Bay Area um, as, as a tool for youth development, as a tool for uh, creating pathways for higher education, uh, gender equity, all different types of, of, of issues that, that, are, uh, that are really relevant. Um, and so it's, there's so many different ways that, that sport does inter intersect with social justice. And I think the work that you all are doing here um, is wonderful because I think sometimes we get very siloed. We kind of, us as practitioners working on the ground, we don't necessarily have the perspective of researchers and what's happening. And I think sometimes the reverse is also true where researchers can get disconnected from what, what it's actually like to be running these programs and interacting with young people on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, it's really nice to kind of bring those things together. Um, so I'm not the most high tech. Uh, so e even in addition to, uh, in addition to, you know, even within the, the direct service field, uh, there's a lot of different issues that, that sports being, uh, that sport is addressing. And for us, one of the things that, uh, one of the main issues that, that we interact with is the global displacement crisis. So right now, there are 65 million people that are displaced across the world, including 30 million children. Um, that is the highest at any point in history, um, and that number is growing. And when you look at climate change and a lot of the situations globally and what's happening in Europe, what's happening here, uh, what's happening in the Middle East, um, it's likely that the number of displaced people is going to continue to grow. Um, and so. What happens is that once people are displaced, they, they flee to find safety, um, and that happens through a number of different a number of different avenues. Historically, the U.S. has been the largest uh, formal re refugee resettlement recipient in a formal way, receiving seventy thousand people. Under the current administration, that has gone down uh, below twenty thousand. They're trying to reduce it even further, uh, but that but that is uh, historically been something that I think uh, the U.S. can be can be proud of is, is being a place of, of refuge, of sanctuary for people that are fleeing conflicts. Um, the Bay Area as well, a lot of people don't know this, but the Bay Area is, in Oakland specifically, is, uh, is home to a, a large refugee resettlement hub. Um, and now, as things are getting more expensive, that's becoming more complicated as well. Um, but, but historically, uh, Oakland has a large refugee community. And we started, Soccer Without Borders started working with the refugee community in Oakland in 2006 uh, as, a, as a camp just in the summer, which Danya com has come out to many times and graced us with her presence um, and, um, and coaching and, and, um, and educational uh, work that she's going to share more about. Um, but it has since evolved, and I'm going to tell you guys a little bit more about that. Um, so when, when newcomers come, uh, it's, it's a very difficult situation. So a lot of times they're fleeing past traumas. A lot of, a lot of times they're fleeing war. Uh, gang violence, uh, all a huge spectrum of, of things that are hard for anybody, much less a young person. Um, and then they're trying to navigate a new culture, a new language here in the U.S. Um, a lot of times in uh, in neighborhoods that are already under resourced and stressed. Um, and so, one thing that I wanted to point out is, especially now, uh, there's an increasing number of what I refer to as unaccompanied minors. So we have. In Oakland schools since 2014, we've had 1,400 young people from mostly from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador who have enrolled in the school district that came from that uh, from the journey from their home countries by themselves, and are now enrolled in Oakland schools. Um, and so, we have been working with uh, the Alameda County Behavioral Health Services to start teams for those young people. Um, our Hanis, who's here, some of you might be his classmate at Tennyson High School, has done some work with, with some of those young people. is an amazing is an amazing mentor amazing teacher. Um, and we also have a program there to, to further support those students. Um, and so one of the things is with, with, with all those challenges, uh, a lot of times that can be overwhelming. You see a, a, a national school dropout rate of over 40% for English language learners. Um, school dropout rate 
across the board is very high, but there's an additional challenge with language and cultural barriers as well there. Um, so it's just kind of the context in which we're working. Um, our mission is, is really about using soccer as a, as a tool for positive change and specifically working with newcomer youth. We talk a lot about growth, inclusion, and personal success. Uh, personal success means that it's, that's something very different for different people, right? It's not everybody is gonna go on to four-year college and that's not necessarily the best pathway for everybody. But what does make the most sense for that young person and how do we support them? So uh, just before I get into the slide, just the people pictured here, that's Nukin, who came from Burma. Uh, he's a refugee from the Burma-Thai border. He's Karen. In 2009, he was in our program for 10 years. He's now coaching. And that's Esu, who's one of the U12 girls, uh, who's also Karen, and they're cousins. There's a lot of cousins in, in, our, in our program. Uh, but it's just beautiful to see that somebody in the program for that amount of time coming in, staying back, and then coming on to give back in this way. Uh, but our focus really you know, given some of the, the circumstances that the young people are leaving um, and, and what they're trying to build is focusing on safe space, access, and social capital. Um, and uh, I could talk a lot about each of these areas, but it's really, there's a really very intentional way that we try to work with young people and a very intentional approach that we have to, to making a space feel welcoming. So a lot of times you'll have young people that speak 12 different languages. Uh, some of them will not necessarily have any English, and some will have great English, uh, all in one space trying to practice together. Uh, they are very competitive, and so there can obviously be tensions there. And so how do you make that a space where everybody can get along? Uh, how do you make that a space where people feel uh, appreciated for their, for their unique cultural uh, background? And how do you have that a space where people feel uh, that they're able to express themselves beyond just being able to play together and actually become comfortable? Uh, that takes a lot of work, a lot of thought, and a lot of effort. Um, and a whole kind of framework that we, that we created as well. Um, so just quickly, it's a little strange. I think you'll hear from three different groups today. I think we are now on the relatively more mature side of organizations in this sector, being 14 years old and also being a, a global organization. Um, we started, though, all volunteer-based. Nobody made any money doing this for four or five years. And through time and perseverance, we were able to kind of prove our impact, uh, start applying for grants, et cetera. And we're now at a point where I think we have 50 employees in these different, commu uh, in these different communities. Um, and um, you know, this is just a little bit of a snapshot about the different places that we're working. Um, we have programs in Baltimore, Boston, Greeley, Oakland, and Seattle in the US, and then Nicaragua and Uganda internationally, and Afghanistan. We work with the Afghanistan Women's National Team to support that group to be able to function uh, financially, but then also with some technical assistance and some other, some other priorities. So um, there are youth from 68 countries represented in our programs. So just in Oakland, the young people in our program in Oakland come from 32 different countries. Uh, the team that I'm coaching right now on Saturday, we'll have a game. They will have 11 players on the field and they'll be from 10 different countries that are, that are starting. Uh, and it's kind of an amazing, it's a, kind of an amazing thing. They're all just acclimating here. Um, so I think one of the, one of the things that we're, we are very proud of is, uh, especially at the international sites, is a, a big emphasis on uh, creating opportunities for girls to play and also having female participants. In Nicaragua, the staff is uh, 12 and 11 of them are women, which, uh, when you look across the, the programs there, uh, it's very rare for there to be female coaches um, here, but even more so in, 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 in that country and in the community where we're working. Um, <clears throat> finally, uh, just on, on this slide, the program obviously uses soccer as kind of a, as a, as a key, as a, a primary activity, but it's not the main focus of what we're doing. There's also a educational support, uh, civic engagement activities, team building, and cultural exchange. So there's sort of a a holistic program model where uh, we use soccer as a way to build community and get people in, engaged, but then we're also adding these other these other elements to make sure that we're able to help them to go on to graduate um, and 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 ultimately become successful members of the community. Um, we're up to two thousand four hundred thirty-seven participants. This was two thousand eighteen. That's regular participants, so kids who are coming to sixty percent or more of what is being offered. Um, I think. Sometimes organizations get really caught up in talking about numbers and how many people they're serving. Uh, I think somebody coming to a clinic one time is really, you're not gonna have a, a big impact. I think Scott hit at this. Um, 
And I, I just, consistency is everything. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but these programs go year round. Uh, kids are spending between eight and 12 hours per week with us. It's a, it's a real mentorship, it's a real intervention in their lives. It's not just, let's come to, let's come to the field and we'll play once a month and we'll see you again. Um, there's really a consistent mentorship uh, aspect that happens through that. Uh, this is, sorry, this is, this is one of the statistics we're, we're most proud of. 95% uh, high school graduation rate of our regular participants. So that doesn't mean somebody who's coming once in a while is gonna have that effect, but kids who are regularly coming to 60% or more of our activities are graduating from high school. Uh, that's a 61% average for limited English speakers nationally. Uh, Oakland actually is doing better than the national with limited English speakers, which is fantastic. Uh, Hayward is as well. Um, and that's due to the excellent work that a lot of people have done at the district, um, both in Hayward and in Oakland and at the county to really support these students and prioritize these students is actually, uh, we have some of the most innovative curriculum for these students, um, even anywhere across the US. Um, just keeping my eye on the clock, I, on the clock I, I'll, I'll move through these last couple slides quickly, but uh, this is another thing that we're really proud of is that we have 76% of our youth stay in our program from year in to year out. Um, there are a lot of different things that they could be doing. Um, and we really, you know, I mentioned Yukin who came in in 2009 and he stayed from under 12 all the way up through under 19 and he's now coaching. Um, we really do start to see the sweet spot of the impact of our program over many years. Um, it's not the kind of thing where, you know, if you come for one season, I think that's, that's good, but where we really start to see the best impact is when, when young people are invested in the programs long term. Um, just quickly, Matt mentioned a couple of these awards, but uh, we have been recognized by a lot of different groups. This is a slide I got to go to London and meet Messi and Ronaldo and those guys, and that was great. But I think, again, to Scott's point, I, I think there's far too much emphasis put on the celebrity aspect of it. I think the people who are really the ones who be, should be lauded and, and lifted up are the coaches, the people who are out there every day doing the work, uh, washing the shin guards, uh, lugging, having their cars full of soccer balls and that little turf stuff on the field. And those are the people to me that I get more excited about than seeing Messi or Ronaldo. Um, and just, just last, I just want to do a little bit of a deeper dive into Oakland. Um, so we, we're now at 15 teams. Uh, we, we have programs at uh, Castlemont, Fremont High, Oakland International, uh, Tennyson High in Hayward, Oakland High, uh, various, a number of different middle schools where we work in partnership specifically with the newcomer uh, teachers at those schools to, to provide programming for those students. Of course, if other students want to come, we don't turn people away. Um, our program is 100% free to participate, and we do participate in leagues where they are playing sometimes at a pretty high level. Our kids are good. Um, we, we have won state tournaments, um, and uh, that's the boys' side. On the girls' side, they're mostly coming from places where they don't get to play, haven't played before, and so they're more new. Um, but they, this year, they are in first place in their league, which is the first time ever, uh, which, is, which is pretty exciting for us. Um, and then I, I just one thing I want to highlight is alumni coaches. Um, to me, this is something that I'm most proud of, of the organization's work, is that right now we have six alumni coaches currently on staff. Uh, one of them is a student here. He's not able to come, but his, he is attending Cal State East Bay in his second year. Um, and he's an assistant coach at the team at the Castlemont program um, while he's studying here in the kinesiology department. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful young man. Um, and finally, just a couple of challenges be before, I, before I pass it over. Um, I think one of the main things that we do, and I think programs like ours do, is address barriers to why young people can't participate in these types of programs, right? Obviously cost is the first one. Sometimes some of the teams that we play against, those kids are paying $1,200 per season to participate uh, in the same league that we are, and that's just a non-starter right away. I mean, even $100 for many of our families would be a non-starter. So there's obviously that one, but there's also many other barriers. So thinking about gender norms, language barriers, family responsibilities. Uh, a huge one is work as the cost of living has gone up. Uh, you see kids as young as 14, 15 going to school and then working from four up until 11 o'clock. And this is, this is literally the norm for many, many of our students. Um, and then they're trying to, you know, trying to stay on top of stuff and getting home 12, 1230, trying to go to school. I'm sure many people in this room also have that experience where You've, you're, you're both studying and trying to work and just how do you balance all those things. It's hard as a college student, it's, it's even when you're 14, 15, it's, it's another level. Um, a couple of other things up here, um, just 
bureaucracy in general. We have to have these player passes when we go play in leagues. That's a huge challenge. We have different, diff different of our young people have different forms of documentation of ID to prove their age, et cetera. That's not always easy to access. They don't always trust to give that in, especially in the current climate uh, where those things are a big issue. Um, and the last thing I'll mention before I turn it over is just some of the challenges for us uh, to implement these programs. I think the big one is, again, rising cost of living. As for teachers, for youth workers, it's increasingly hard to support people to do this work. Uh, our coordinators and our coaches are putting in a tremendous amount of time and effort, um, and they're not compensated in a way that is easy to live here um, as the barrier becomes more and more expensive. Um, transportation, political climate, field access is obviously a big challenge as well. So. Um, that's a little bit about, about Soccer Without Borders. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna wrap it up there. And um, if anybody's interested, this is um, a picture from last year. Uh, from We do an event every year with, with Matt and the Pioneer Soccer Club. Uh, and this coming up in a couple weeks where we're gonna have two of our teams. This is our team from Castlemont. And this is our team from uh, one of our teams from Oakland International that came and got to play in the stadium. Uh, it's a really fun event. I think Paul, is Paul, Paul's gonna play. Uh, so if anybody wants to come out, that's going to be in a couple weeks um, and meet some of our students. And uh, we really enjoy that event. So thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to Missy. Excellent. Thank you, Ben. I'll invite Ashley and Kate to uh, come on and get set up. We also have a few seats up here at the front. If people want to make their way, we've got three or four seats up front. So please, this is a good time uh, to do that as well. I'm honored to introduce uh, Ashley Masters and Kim Woozy with Skate Like a Girl. We've done a fair amount of work with them, research out in the community. Actually, I learned to skate in November, December when I was out at a program doing research. She's like, put the computer down if it looks pretty fun. And it looked really fun, so I had to go learn to skate. So uh, that's the exciting part of, of doing this job, sort of like what Scott said, is we, we have fun doing our job. We love what we do. Um, so. Can't wait to hear more about the program. So I'll leave it up to you all. Hello. All right. Hi, guys. What's going on? So my name is Kim Woozy. And I'm just going to give you guys a little brief background about who I am. Um, I actually grew up here in Fremont, um, played team sports growing up. Every sport, soccer actually was my main sport. I was a goalkeeper. Um, and then played basketball and water polo. Um, and then in college, I actually got more into board sports, action sports. Um, and I ended up, my first internship in college was at a skate shoe company. I went to UCSD down in San Diego. Um, and that kind of set off my journey of being in action sports. Um, and so that led me to actually pursuing a career in marketing um, at this shoe company. And I was just really stoked to be able to build like the two worlds of both sport and then fashion and creativity and self-expression, which I thought was really unique and different than, than team sports. Um, and that led me down the path of actually working with female skateboarders, um, which back then was a very small group of people, um, but it was exciting. And uh, the company that I was at kind of let me do whatever I want, which was really cool. Um, and ended up just creating all these relationships with these female skateboarders that no one knew of at all, because back then no one knew of anything about female skateboarders and then um, ended up starting my own company uh, in media production because that's what I went to school for. And then that led me to actually working with a number of different um, friends and colleagues, other women in the skateboarding industry as this participant demographic really grew, right? So historically uh, skateboarding has been very male dominated and over the past decade, we've really seen more and more girls participate, dads encouraging their girls to participate. Um, girls seeing other girls skating on the internet, on YouTube, on Instagram. Um, so it really changed the landscape. So that brings me to here today where I actually moved back to the Bay Area after being in SoCal for 10 years. And I was like, cool, like what skate parks are around? Like, let me find, you know, reconnect with my people because back in San Diego, I had lots of people to skate with, snowboard, all that stuff. Um, and I looked around and there was like no one, right? And so I was like, man, like that really sucks. Like when I was 15 growing up in the Bay Area, all I wanted was to like be able to skate and find people to skate with. Um, back then there was less parks, but 
Even so, you know, I try to show up at a park and kind of feel awkward. Um, and even in the industry, I never really felt invited or included to skateboard. It was kind of like a, oh, I'm working, or all the guys would like take their breaks or lunch breaks and go skate. And any of the women in the office would kind of just be like, oh, that's nice, like cool. Um, and we were never really invited or included. Or if I was like working, I'd be like at X Games, right? It's not like I can just like go drop into the, <laughs> the 20 foot vert ramp. Um, so I was like, wow, like even someone who has access on the very kind of like top level to the products, the events, everything, private skate parks, I never felt like it was for me. And it was always really intimidating. So I moved back here and actually um, I knew about this organization called Skate Like a Girl that was started in Olympia, Washington 17 years ago um, through my work in the skate industry. And we had a chapter here in the Bay Area, but it was very small, very grassroots. But I started meeting up with these women and just skating. And it was the first time I ever felt like it, like I was invited and it was okay to not be a pro skater, right? Um, so I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I, that was the most I ever skated. And then over the course of a year, um, as the other, the rest of the chapters were growing and really like, you know, legitimate 501c3 funding grants, they basically said to the Bay Area chapter, they're like, hey, you guys, like, if you kind of, we need you guys to step up. Otherwise, we're going to have to like cut you because there's insurance, there's all kinds of structures, right? So the chapter actually went on hiatus for about a year and I didn't skate at all. I was like, well, that sucks. Um, and then I met Ashley at a panel actually in Berkeley um, that I was speaking on and she was like, I've taught skateboarding my whole life. And I was like, what? Like, where have you been? So I was like, we need to talk. And so we got to talking and she was like, my whole background's in coaching and teaching. I've been skateboarding. So I'm like a beginner-ish skateboarder. I don't know. I guess who, it depends on who you ask. But I wouldn't consider myself like super good. So I was always like, oh, like how am I going to teach skateboarding if I like, I'm still learning myself? Mostly just cruiser skating, you know? Um, and so uh, we got to talking and we're like, let's do this. Like, there's no reason why we can't do this. It's happening in Seattle. It's happening in Portland. Um, so we took it on, and uh, this is our third year now. Uh, again, it was volunteer um, the first year and a half. It still kind of feels voluntary. It's a part-time job for both of us. Um, and so, yeah, that's I, my role as director of de development, and then Ashley is director of programming, and I'll let Ashley introduce herself. Thank you. Awesome. Um, hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Ashley. Um, also, in the work we do, we also share pronouns, because skateboarders show up looking a ton of different ways. Um, so pronoun, if you're not familiar, is what we use when we're not calling you by your name. So again, my name is Ashley. I use she, her, they, or them pronouns. Um, it's just good practice to help really normalize letting people show up and let them be self-identified. So yeah, anyways, um, so my story is I grew up in Southern California, uh, been up here in the Bay Area, predominantly the East Bay for over 10 years now. Um, went to UC Santa Cruz, um, and really went down the route of like social work. Um, and I grew up skating since I was like about fifth grade, grew up, uh, grew up skating with like, um, all, all guys. And it was awesome skating every single day, every second of the day, loved it. Um, um, and then as I grew up, like skating was always there. I played soccer, I played basketball, I played a ton of, uh, team sports, had a lot of coaches where I learned what not to be as a coach. So I ended up coaching a lot through my life um, and turning out, um, being a lot of spaces um, to like be a mentor and show up for young people how I wish people would have showed up for me at that age. So um, I have a minor in education and degree in what's called community studies uh, through UC Santa Cruz. Um, and so uh, I was always skateboarding and it helped me through um, different parts of my life that were challenging, having parents locked up, deported, uh, stuff like that, um, keeping me on track to stay positive and keep it moving. Um, and so as I was kind of navigating college and all that stuff, I ended up working in nonprofit sector a ton, um, specifically around juvenile justice and working with a lot of youth who are affected by um, incarceration. Um, and so never putting two together, skateboarding and like uh, mentorship. I just kept kind of cruising around, finding nonprofits, kind of ping ponging my way, not really finding anything that I was like in love with and super passionate about, but learned a ton. Um, and then I moved up to the Bay and I found um, a couple really awesome internships um, and stuck around. And along the way, I happened to be at a skate park one day, uh, Berkeley Skate Park specifically, and ran into some people. And they're like, hey, what's up? Be here for the event. And I was like, what event? And it happened to be one of the Skate Layer Girl events. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Because I didn't see a lot of people um, that look like me growing up skating at skate parks or just skating in general. Um, however, from a young age, I was 
definitely pushed by my environment, um, specifically my family, to be like, Psh, just do you, do what you want to do. Um, so I got really blessed in that way. Um, so when I came across this skate like a girl space, I really realized that I had already kind of built up the confidence to skate wherever I kind of wanted and deal with um, the great things that people had to say to me as a female skateboarder and the not so great. Um, and so realizing what a privilege I had growing up in the environment that I did, um, and then moving away to LA to take care of my mom for a bit, came back up and was like, yeah, I really want like a crew to skate with. And like, I want that. Where's skate like a girl? And so I came back up and I was like, all right, skate like a girl, where you at? Like, I want a squad to skate with, you know? I want to skate with um, people that, um, that look like me, you know? Um, I want that sense of community. And um, when I got back up, it was on hiatus. And I was like, no. And so um, at the same time, while this is going on, social media and whatnot, I was really seeing um, the women's and girls like skate scene really blossom. And I was like knocking on the window being like, how do I get in here? Let me in. I'm over here. Um, and so I had kind of knew who Kim Woozy was um, in that spe specific scene and uh, what an amazing human she is in helping that blossom. And so I just happened to be scrolling through that thing called Instagram and saw an event in Berkeley. And I was like, oh, Kim Woozy is going to be on this panel. Um, and she's the only woman speaking on the panel. And it's literally called Navigating the Skateboard Industry. And I was like, I'm going to go. We're going to be best friends. I don't know what I'm going to say, but we're, it's going to happen. I don't know. Let's go. And so I went and literally that's uh, now we're here. Um, so it's been really cool um, and amazing. And finally found that dream. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. All right, so I'm just going to give you guys a, a little brief overview of like what the organization is about. Um, oftentimes, people don't know, um, and I didn't fully know until we participated. Um, but as I mentioned, we are actually committed to creating an inclusive community by using the vehicle of skateboarding. Um, and our mission is to actually instill and promote confidence, leadership, and social justice through skateboarding. So it's actually not really about skateboarding, but it is all about skateboarding. Um, and, you know, why people always ask why, well, historically, um, you know, for those of you who may not know a ton about skate culture, women and girls and youth even have been really marginalized and treated unfairly and objectified. So we're really up to creating equity for these groups of people who may not have felt included or invited, whether it was at a skate park or looking at skate media, you know, things like Thrasher magazine. Um, so that's why we exist. We're in Seattle, Portland, SF Bay area. We're also online, as we mentioned. Um, social media is a very important tool for us and the entire community to self-publish, self-express, and really take away those gatekeepers that existed for a long time. Um, we serve women and youth. And so people always ask, oh, is it for girls only? And we're actually like, well, for 12 and under, we do actually have many programs that are all genders. And part of it is like the work we're doing, we're really wanting to um, flip that narrative and ha and be radical in the sense that there's young boys in our programs learning from from adult female expert skaters, and that really changes their mindset from an early age, right? So we're not about excluding and isolating; we're really about like doing it together, like shifting that narrative together. Um, we have women's clinics, school programs, summer camps, and an annual event called Wheels of Fortune up in Seattle. Um, and here's just, you know, some of our programming. Um, right now, currently in the Bay Area, we partner with Bay Area Roller Derby, and they have, we have an amazing indoor warehouse in West Oakland um, where we're able to do a lot of really formal clinics. Um, we do a lot of programming at skate parks, which is really great because we have amazing skate parks here in the Bay Area. Um, however, they are public skate parks. We have limited, you know, control if it rains or if it's just really crowded that day. So having a, a private space is really helpful in A, delivering our programming and B, actually being able to create that safety that many of our participants come to the skate park and said like, I'm so scared to go to skate park. Um, so thank you for having this space. So that's been really integral. Um, we do summer camps. Last year we did our first QT skate camp. Um, Lacey Baker, who's a professional skateboarder, um, came and was a guest coach. And um, we did we st launched summer camps for the first time last year in um, Oakland. And we also did an adult women's camp, which was really amazing. The average age was 30. Um, the oldest participant was 47. So if anyone's like, I'm too old to skateboard, that's definitely not true. And we can prove you wrong. <laughs> um, and then we do school programs which we found has been really great because just being able to meet youth where they're at. Um, there's always going to be people who come to the skate park, have the resources that have parents that can bring them. However, when we go to schools, that's really when people who wouldn't access, wouldn't have that, you know, ability really get to participate. 
Um, that's our annual event. It's coming up on 10 years, which is amazing. It's one of the largest gatherings of uh, female identified skateboarders in the world. Um, it's super fun. And then here's just some numbers. Last year, uh, we made space for and taught over 7,000 skateboarders in all of our chapters. We have over 180 volunteers, 18 schools, and we hosted 326 events in, in all of our cities. Um, and we have a number of volunteers that are actually uh, students here at CSU East Bay, including Jay, who's in the back of the room, as well as Vanessa, who I know is a kinesiology student as well. Um, and then, you know, we just have some of our initiatives um, coming up this year. Uh, we're actually looking to really um, meet that teen demographic. For us, that's the missing demographic. Um, we find that younger girls are excited to try new things. Their parents, you know, bring them out. And then adult women have, like, you know, you all, like, at this age, maybe you have your ability to be, you know, get on BART and get to the skate park or drive over and try something new. But that teenage demographic, we've noticed over and over again, um, if they're already, if they're not already doing something, it's harder for them to break out of their, their shell. And if their group of friends aren't doing it, they're not going to be as inclined to be like, let's try something new. So it's, it's a little bit of the peer pressure and the looking good and looking cool. Um, so we're lo looking to develop uh, more of a teen club concept so that they can continue to show up and have that consistency, kind of like a soccer team or, you know, like me and Ashley both played team sports growing up. So that's a little bit about us. Um, and just in the last few minutes, I think um, we'd love to just, you know, share with you guys kind of two main things that's interesting about skateboarding specifically. Um, I think I'll turn it over to Ash really quickly, but just like why skateboarding, right? Like why skateboarding? How does it, you know, compare or differ from other team sports? Um, and why is it, are we seeing this kind of explosion of participation? So Ash. Awesome, thanks Kim. Yeah, so why skateboarding? Um, skateboarding is a hidden gem, whether people skate for a day, for a week, for a month, for the rest of their life. And the reason why is that you have to literally fail a thousand times before you ever succeed. Um, and personally, I think that's a beautiful education model. Um, also the sort of resilience that it takes um, internally, but also like your community. So for some reason you carry around a skateboard and you've been giving it a try, you see someone else's skateboard, there's like an instant bond there. Now, every time, most skate parks, you might run into, you know, um, a person that's not the nicest or the greatest, but for the most part, skaters are pretty awesome in that they see, they understand that you have that kind of common bond in terms of resilience. Um, the other thing about skateboarding is that it's deeply rooted in everything we want. It's called fun. Okay? It's straight up fun. There's no rules like basketball, soccer, anything like that. Um, so with that being said, that it's just strictly rooted in fun that it means you get to get show up and just be creative and you have to be fully present I can't be like texting and like checking out Instagram and having FOMO and all that I have to literally be present or else I'm slamming or something like that and so with that there's like a sort of therapeuticness and healing to it as well um, so again whether people can articulate this sort of benefit they get from skating or not it's happening and it's very powerful and really awesome um, the other cool things about skating is that it's the only place in my life I've realized that I interact with people this big and people this big and intergenerational sort of conversation and relationships and stuff like that and there's no requirement to show up at a public park or anything like that it's really awesome and a really special place and with that being said it's sort of a microcosm and what sort of in the work that we do we see it as a microcosm for the world so we're trying to recreate the culture in which that we live in this world together um, so yeah it's pretty awesome yeah, and I think that's just it right there is that the microcosm for society. Um, like I grew up playing basketball and soccer and it was I always felt like a really safe space because it was like girls practice, right? And then it was like we'd leave and the guys would come in. Um, what's unique about the skate park, which is starting to really like as we've seen in moving borders, um, it really reflects um, a little kind of a smaller example of society. And so we have the opportunity to really like practice those those cult cultural shifts that we're looking to create in the world so oftentimes again like i said earlier girls would come up show up and be so scared right and we encourage them and support and they learn to actually be more brave in the setting of maybe expert skaters or a bunch of males and then they can take that brave like you know the bravery into the world maybe in school or in the workplace or even like riding the BART train right so um that's something that's really special and i think as we move forward um you know one of the big announcements is skateboarding is going to be in the olympics for 2020 um both men and women and so that's going to be really great because there's going to be visibility. But what's more exciting about the actual just the Olympics is the fact that 
people will see that it's, you know, there's women and male, men participating and they'll be able to take that on into their own neighborhoods, their own cultures. So we're starting to see skateboarding really grow in places like Afghanistan, India, the Philippines, all over, you know, um, South America, actually Brazil is a big skate country. Um, so just like the, the low barrier to entry, like literally all you need is a board. You don't even actually need shoes because in India there's like this crew called the barefoot skaters. Um, and just continuing to allow um, kids to be physical and express without some of the barriers of, you know, needing like a, a uniform or a field or uh, coaches and things like that. So that's something that's really exciting um, that we're looking forward to seeing as we move forward. And that's it. Thank you all. Great. Thank you so much. Excellent to hear from this program, SLAG, and to work with them. I'm going to invite Danya uh, Cabello to come on up, please. Danya is here. She's um, known for her work with Futbolistas, a program in the Fruit Vale uh, that Matt was talking about, Dr. Atencio was talking about, and uh, has done just an amazing job with that program. And we've kept in touch a little bit. I know she's doing some excellent work these days, too. So I'm excited to hear about that. Um, I know some people have to leave. Classes end around 4.55. I highly encourage you, if you do have the time, please stick around for the next 15 minutes. You will not regret hearing um, from Dania and her story and her work that she does in the community. Um, it'll be about 15-minute talk. And then we'll have a question and answer after that, too, with everyone. So... Also, lots of food in the back. If you want to grab some food, please make sure to grab some food. All right, looks like we've got everything set. So uh, without further ado, this is uh, Dania here to talk with you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Everybody, um, you've been sitting super patiently and listening to some amazing work. I'm a huge fan of all the people um, that I get to be on this panel with. So I'm, I'm really grateful also to have an opportunity to talk to an audience. Um, because this is a, in some ways a moment, um, it's a moment of power when you get to talk in front of a group of people and share experience. It's not every day that I get to stand in front of a hundred people um, and share my practice. Um, so I'm going to actually take you on a journey with me, uh, my journey of being a, a lifelong self-proclaimed student athlete. I am no longer in any institution as a student. Um, but my practice is really informed by constant kind of curiosity and thirst for knowledge about this thing that I love so much called sports. So I'm going to take you on a journey with me from Futbolista to Oakland Street Stylers. Um, in last year, I was a part of a, a group that um, we had a film come out. Oh, right on. We had a film come out. Thank you. About work that we had started doing in Oakland Public Schools. Uh, our program was called Futbolistas for Life. And back in 2009, when I started this program, which was like a lifetime ago, because I no longer work there, but the film came out last year, so people are like, what's up with your work in, in East Oakland? And I'm like, oh, it's, it's evolved. I'm not there. Um, but I'm going to tell you what it was. I think this is something that as students interested in sport, it might spark some curiosity or some ideas for yourself. We were at a school in East Oakland called Life Academy. Are there any Life Academy alums in the... Nope. Nope. Okay. Um, Life Academy is a small school, part of Oakland Unified School District, and we had switched campuses. We were one of those small schools that like got shuttled around in the mid 2000s. Um, we lost our campus over on across from Taco Sinaloa on 21st and International, and we're moved to 35th and Foothill at the old Calvin Simmons campus. And when we got to this campus, we were sharing a school site with another middle school. At the time, we were a high school. Since then, Life Academy has opened up a middle school. And at this school, we had a huge cement lot. And the kids used to call it the prison playground. Um, and we didn't have a place to play soccer, but we had a group of high school senior girls that I had, I had 
kind of like I did today, I kind of neglected to tell you my history in soccer. I had neglected to tell the history of my soccer experience to a lot of the kids in Oakland I was working with because it didn't feel relevant in that moment. I was like, I'm dedicated to teaching, to innovation, to creating this internship program. And when the girls were like, wait, hold up, you played soccer at UC Berkeley and you played professionally in Brazil? Why are we not playing something? And I was like, well, where are we going to play? We don't have a field. And I would kind of put this world of sports that I had been so deeply immersed in, when I decided to commit myself to education, I left it because I didn't see the connection between the world of elite sports that I had participated in most of my life and the really important work that needed to be done in Oakland Public Schools. Um, so these girls had an idea to start a club and we met twice a week. It was a group of senior girls and freshman boys that were just down to do soccer drills. And in the first three months of this program, I realized, and I just ran the drills like a regular, like serious training session, and they were into it. And I'm like, wow. In three months of this program, I started seeing very, some what I would call superficial shifts in the sense of superficial being like the way that the kids dressed, the kind of this identity of like sports wear that the boys and the girls were starting to adopt, which in that moment for a lot of these students was really different from their traditional kind of like really tight jean clothing, um, you know, that was really cute that high school students like to wear, but there was kind of an identity shift beginning to happen and, I, and, and the, the crew started being seen as like kind of a, a culture keeping space at the school and I thought, okay, something, I can't quite put my finger on it, but something powerful is happening with this group Playing soccer twice a week isn't enough. I had been um, a part of a group in Oakland called uh, Left Wing Football Club that was an anti-imperialist, community-centered, grassroots soccer club for adults and kids in all ages to create a different type of soccer that wasn't hyper-competitive. The score was always two to two. Ben has played with me on that team. Um, and I thought, all right, one of the things that binds us as adults together, like we have this particular language, anti-imperialist, but like how do you get students that don't quite have that language to understand what that even means? So that's where I started using the futbolistas as a space to just do total, we didn't, I didn't have to worry about training the next Mia Ham because we didn't have a field. I got to do part clinics, part, sorry, part workshop where we talked and explored dynamics of power. What is power? How does it work? How do you flip it? Who writes the rules? And then we would go and we would design our own soccer practices where we would work on our literacy. We would work on writing our own rules. We would work on um, looking at themes of inclusion. And there was something in our limitation of not having a field that actually gave us freedom to get extra creative because I didn't have to worry about driving across town to play another team. So kind of within this limitation of what we had, um, we started this innovative soccer program that explored issues of race, gender, power, equity, inclusion. Um, and somebody caught word of this. And they also caught word that in the meantime, we were campaigning to build a soccer field on our prison playground. Um, we... I don't know if this link will work. I'm gonna show you just a two minute trailer of, a, of the film that was released on a KQED last summer. Um, nope, maybe I won't. So anyways, you can look up the trailer for Futbolistas for Life film, but essentially, it tra it's okay. Um, it captures three people's stories of within the Futbolista family. Mine, uh, Benjamin Gonzalez in the top left and my futbolista April um, in the middle and my own family story. My family, we were political refugees from Chile that arrived to Oakland in the 70s. My two students, uh, Benjamin was born in Mexico. Uh, April, her parents immigrated to Mexico. She was born here and it documents and chronicles our story. It's really about, the film has like very little to do with soccer and mostly everything to do with mental health and immigration right now. So even though we don't work in these films and April's now a junior at UC Berkeley and Benjamin has graduated and has a son and has started a small business in Oakland, um, the timeliness of this story being put out into the world now in 
under this administration has been really important to humanize the experience of who are undocumented folks. Like, what is the day-to-day -day life like? What does it feel like when you're driving down International Boulevard and you see La Migda right next to you? Um, this film was super, in my eyes, important because it didn't tell, it's not one of those like, coach comes in and does the whatever. Um, it's like, this is our reality. This is what it means to live under this um, administration and these kind of policies that separate families um, and then deem our bodies illegal. And then it ends up capturing this within that, the story of the campaign that we won, $100,000 from the US Soccer Federation, plus matching funds to transform our prison playground into one of the most beautiful fields that I have seen in all of Oakland. Um, what you don't see pictured on the far right is a mural that was painted in the 90s. Some of my friends that actually went to Berkeley High School were the muralists of like this huge cosmos. Um, and this is our field. And a year after we had this field, there were six new, six or seven teams from our school campus. There was a girls, uh, high, two girls high school teams, two boys teams, and then two teams for the middle school, and then the other middle school had, oh, eight teams. So anyways, in short, there were eight teams that were had that used this field regularly for practice and games. So you went from having no organized school pro soccer program to having eight in one year. Um, I left Life Academy to go back to graduate school. I went back to where I played undergrad soccer. I went to UC Berkeley and got my master's in this department called the Cultural Studies of Sports and Education. And one of the questions that, has, that I kind of sit with a lot is this question of what makes you feel free? You know, there was a lot of kind of movement towards our liberation and this idea of like creating a space. And when I got to graduate school, I had the privilege of being able to remove myself a little bit from the work and just spend some valuable time thinking and reflecting and reading about things around my work. And I'm my best critic. And I was critical of like, all right, cool. So we did, we built a field in East Oakland and how is, how are other places gonna build a field if you don't happen to have a huge cement lot? Like it's not necessarily a sustainable model that can be replicated anywhere. Um, and so I started to think about this question of like, what, what is freedom? How do we manifest this? If I really believe that sports, which is a microcosm of society, it's problematic, there's a lot of tension implicit, there's a lot of violence in the sports, like modern day sports, and we understand it. Yet at the same time, I have felt so many moments of freedom and joy and positive power. Um, what is that all about? Like, how do I move through that as a student and athlete and a learner? And I started with this question of like, what makes you feel free? What makes me feel free? Um, pictured here is my friend Bayan and Miriam, both uh, one current and one former student of Soccer Without Borders. And this was at an art exhibit that we did. So I, I had to take myself away from the field for a minute. And I thought, let me go to the arts because the arts is a space where I can really fully express myself. And at Soma Arts last year, we had a, a group exhibit with all local Bay Area artists um, around the idea of freedom. It was called Game Recognize Game. And uh, these young women from Soccer Without Borders were in the exhibit um, as both participants activating a space that was not typically meant for play, as in a gallery, because typically you go to a gallery and you're supposed to hold your hand behind your back and you look and you'll be really quiet. But here there was music. There were balls flying, there was walls. We did an installation of a 50 foot wall um, that replicated different portions of the um, Palestine-Israel border and the US-Mexico border. And we shot hoops over it and we kicked balls against it. And we reimagined what that space inside the gallery um, could look like. Um, this is artwork featured. Um, we were curious about this question of like, when we think of an athlete, who do we think of? Um, this might look like caricatures, but these are actually really badass women today. Um, this particular woman, uh, Maria, she is from Mexico. She hit news last year for winning a marathon in her huaraches. Um, and these are all players from Bolivia, from the Philippines, um, of like, this is also what athletes look like. Um, and so, 
as my own journey of kind of using the futbolistas as this launching place, um, what would it look like then to take our play to the streets? What does it look like um, to not necessarily be confound by like not having a space to play or needing to figure out to get this amazing field, which is important? And at the same time, there's other things that we can do. We can take our play to the street. So this is my friend Arjuna Saeed and his pops, Ramakrishna, um, in North Oakland, activating a space that is not intended for play. And so I have started thinking about, well, even we have these parks all around town. Um, this one is a basketball court that nobody uses because uh, it hasn't been maintained in years. So there's cracks. So it doesn't get used for basketball or soccer, but here there's three women doing freestyle soccer. So over the past three years, I've gone on my own journey as a futbolista into this question of, um, well, there's this new sport that exists all around the world and it's really young in the US called freestyle soccer. All you need is a ball. You don't need grass, you don't need a space, and that's like kind of one of the hashtags too, hashtag all you need is a ball. You can do it anywhere. Um, and so we started taking this to the streets. This is downtown Oakland. Um, this picture here is in downtown Oakland on Broadway, between Broadway and Telegraph. This is a woman who had just picked up her grandchildren um, and she heard our music. She saw us moving and dancing and so she decided to join us. And this is just a reflective of every single time we take a ball into public streets and spaces, Th this is absolutely what happens. People join, people smile, they ask questions, and they want to play. Because when they see one person playing, you're like, oh, it taps into something of like, I, re I remember playing. And then this is us bringing the ball to uh, Mosswood Park, uh, outside of like the sandbox area, and three kids just like seeing what we're doing and then immediately copying. This, what, he what he's doing is not easy to do, but um, he's doing it. Um, and so with that, it takes me to this uh, kind of where I've been as like a student athlete is thinking about the shadows, thinking about what we don't see. And I see my work as complementary to Skate Like a Girl and to Soccer Without Borders. Soccer Without Borders students come to my community meetups all the time for freestyle. Like anytime I put a call out, there's at least like three to 10 Soccer Without Borders students. So what I'm saying is that this is, this is a complement to the type of really important kind of organized institutions that exist. Um, but what I'm curious about is this idea of the shadow, of what we don't see. So we know the kid that's gonna go and that's gonna choose into a sport at the place, but what about the kid that doesn't wanna choose in or the adult that is like, I don't really feel comfortable joining an adult league. I, the last time I played anything was 25 years ago. Um, there's something really powerful in making ourselves visible. For me, being a Latina woman in Oakland, to kick my soccer ball in the streets is not a common thing. I, and sometimes I do get a little bit shy because I'm actually practicing vulnerability in that moment and you're kind of a spectacle, so there's eyes gonna be looking at me. Um, but I realize the more and more that I do it, the more and more engagement, and not only from mothers and families and children, but from a lot of the people who actually live on the streets. And if you live in any neighborhood in Oakland um, or in this Bay Area, you have seen the number of homeless individuals that are parked and living in subhuman conditions underneath the freeways. And this happens to be right in my neighborhood. So what obligation do we have as street movers to our streets? Um, it's a question that I don't necessarily know I have the answer to, but every time we go and play, a lot of the people that we end up playing with are people who live on the streets. And in that moment, it is a moment of joy and freedom for both of us. Um, and the main difference is that I'll go home after and take a shower and sleep in a comfortable bed and my neighbor won't. So we formed a crew called Oakland Street Stylers. Um, right now, we're a crew of like a handful um, with 
a handful of Oakland uh, Soccer Without Borders students that come and identify and not everybody plays and we have capoeiristas and break dancers um, because freestyle soccer is to music. It's a lot like dancing. Um, it kind of looks like circus acty, uh, but we are committed to this possibility of play as something to disrupt kind of the natural, you know, I have this theory right now that I've been playing with around flow or being in resistance. And I used to say that like, we're in resistance and my joy is my resistance. And I actually disagree with my younger self. I actually feel like my joy is my natural flow. That when I'm in flow with humanity and love and connectivity, what's in resistance to me are the oppressive structures and forces and people and language that are interrupting my natural flow or interrupting the natural flow um, of the right to live in humane conditions of my neighbors. Um, and I think that there's something in this, the possibility of play invites us to, you know, I was invited, I went to a high school here in Oakland that some of you might know about called Head Royce. And if you don't know Head Royce, Head Royce is one of the most expensive private schools probably in the country. It's about four minutes away from Life Academy in East Oakland, yet it is worlds away from each other. And I was invited after 15 years to come back to Head Royce because they heard of all the amazing work I'm doing in East Oakland and they wanted to bridge with East Oakland. I got to this meeting and I'm talking to these really well-intentioned people that I once went to school with for, and I left feeling really deflated, partially because I didn't have an answer. A bridge suggests that we build something on top of and in between two foundations that were built to keep us apart. So a bridge might mean that four kids from Life Academy get to go to the summer program at Head Royce or get that one scholarship like I did to go to Head Royce, but that doesn't do anything to disrupt the foundation of these really isolated communities. And for me, because sports, I do see it as a microcosm of the world. It got me thinking about play as a place to not build a bridge, but to change how we move. Because fundamentally, any of these institutions or systems or structures that we say, oh, that's the law, or that's just the way it works, like, we as humans are upholding those. We are abiding by them or making these things normal or possible. Um, and so I wonder, and freestyle has helped me kind of manifest this of what it looks and feels like to move through the world differently, creatively, and in communion with other people. Um, so all this to bring me back to, um, you know, the importance of organizations like Soccer Without Borders and Skate Like a Girl to be these hubs where people can go to consistently. Um, Oakland Street Stylers is a crew. We're not a 501c3. Nobody has ever paid us for anything. Um, I do my own work around, like, around the US um, doing speaking and curriculum design and teach at St. Mary's College around this idea of liberatory pedagogy for sports. How do we think about freedom, not as like an afterthought before the practice, but like in the soccer, basketball, whatever we're playing, how do we manifest these moments and kind of bring these theories to life in our play? Um, and just the other day I got a call from Life Academy that they got a very tiny bucket of money to bring Oakland Street Stylers to start a freestyle soccer something that has yet to be defined so that we can make freestyle soccer and a lot of our young people at Life Academy to make our bodies and our experience more visible by taking over public space and bringing our play to the streets of the Fruitvale and East Oakland. Um, so with that, um, I thank you. I hope that we can play someday. You can, um, we'd love to join you. You can follow us at Oakland Street Stylers to find out when we have community meetups. You don't have to be a mover or a shaker or a dancer. You can just hang out in the sun with us um, at any of these public spaces where we bring our music and we get down um, and we have a good time. So thank you. Thank you very much to all of our speakers so far. Now we're gonna transition into uh, a panel discussion. So I think I'll have the 
Ashley and Kim maybe come on this side here. I'll have, have Scott kind of moderate it from here. We've only got two mics, so maybe we'll switch spots here. We've got about 25 minutes, folks. So again, we want to flesh out some of these wonderful examples and hubs of humanity. So I'll turn it over to Scott uh, in about 25 minutes. So I'd like to open up the Q&A first. You guys have heard a lot of, uh, of talking. Do you have any questions first? Anyone have a question for any of the panelists? Are y'all going to be shy? OK, I see a question in the back. Thank you. I haven't met met any of them before, but I, I you know, I I know of uh, Soccer Without Borders. Um, interestingly, we we funded a uh, a short documentary on your Baltimore Baltimore chapter. So some of that has happened organically, but otherwise, <laughs> I know I'm I'm not familiar. But I'm not based here right now either. Right. I can I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so yeah, I think that well, one of the like most integral, I would say, factors of us being able to grow so quickly, skate like a girl in the past three years is the community collaborations. Um, and so it's all intertwined, especially in the Bay Area. Like that's what I love so much after being in Southern California for so long that there's such a DIY collaborative community here. Um, so for example, like I know of Fupalistas because of the Women's Sports Film Festival, which I helped take photos at the first one, um, and Skate Like a Girl was on one of the panels, and that's where I met Rita and Becky and Missy, um, who, who it all kind of like came together in so many different ways. So I would say that in one way or another, there's always um, some connection, even when it's, you know, not obvious. It's like, oh, you know, this person, this person, um, up to us sports, I know as a partner for Soccer Without Borders, our coaches are also up to us sports coaches. Um, so yeah, it's, it's very connected and, um, you know, for actually, I think the center for sports and social justice, it's one of the hubs that continues to bring people together. Like I said, me and Ashley met at a panel, right. And that's a little bit beyond, I think some of our organizations like to do regularly, but to have groups like that, like you guys here doing things like this is where a lot of the, the, the partnerships get to start from. So yeah, for sure. Well, and, and you definitely heard how Danya, you know, has these soccer without borders, um, you know, these students coming to her. So there's, you know, there's definitely all of these overlaps. Any other questions at the moment? And and as we go on, whenever you have a question, just make sure you ra you raise your hand. Any other questions? So I I'll I'll speak. Uh, and then kind of offer something to the panel. Danya, did you have a... I did just want to add a thing that like, you know, there's these formal ways of, you know, organizations connecting. I've always sent students to the Skate Like a Girl does these Sunday meetups. Um, and I always send people like their flyer. But there's also something about, you know, I think Ben and I might... First of all, this is my family. Um, we play together. We surf together. We do family dinners together. Um... But there's something to say, like, there's this volunteer culture that can be kind of shallow. And then there's there's actually just engaging and showing up. And I think that's part of this idea of, like, how do you move? I don't need to call him to get an invitation to come to practice. Like, I just show up just to say what's up to the kids. They might be like, jump in, jump out. We don't need you right now. We do need you um, to, to for numbers. But just in thinking about, like, the connection isn't always a formal, like, hello, I will be showing up at this time. But it's like, do you show up ever? You know, to the point where we see each other's students in the streets and it's like, oh, my God, okay, come here. Oh, you need help driving, like, did the driving lessons with one of his kids. Like, these informal things really matter and are hard to quantify. So I think one of the things that is exciting for me, and it, I just came back from a, a conference um, UEFA's equal game, so everything about uh, inclusion across LGBT, race, ethnicity, uh, Paralympic uh, athletes, and so on, and hearing terms like intersectionality, and then hearing you know you all talk about all these key terms that we learn often learn in this space, you know higher ed. So I wanted to know 
how important when you think about your education, Donya, you talked in particular about your grad school and so on, but how important has that education and inclusion been to what it is you all do? Uh, I'll start. Um, <laughs> it's it, like it's two things. It's been important, and also it hasn't wasn't it wasn't everything. Uh, what I learned in grad school, um, when I went back to grad school, I was a full time student. And when you become a grad school student, a graduate student, if that's what you want to do, if you come from working and grinding so hard. Being a graduate student can feel kind of like, whoa, time just got real nebulous. Like all my my work is to to read, you know, and I'm used to like, I'm producing, I'm doing, I'm psh, 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 psh. so it felt kind of like, what's going on here? I'm not doing anything. Um, how important was it? I, the, the actual literature? I don't know, but there was something in that nebulous time that really got me more into mindfulness and meditation and thinking about love. And like, I didn't write about this in my master's paper, but I got a grander sense of like, how do we move through love with what we're doing? Why am I even in graduate school with this crazy um, school debt to study this thing that's hard to even make a living doing? Um, so it, it really is, it, for me, it was two things. It was like, it was important to ground my theory because yes, now I can sit in a room like this at an academic place and talk about the liberatory pedagogy from Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks. But like, I'm not talking like that to my, when I'm on the streets, I'm moving from a place of love, not from a place of like what I know from a book. Yeah, I think I want to piggyback on that. I agree. I think, um, being like one of the first people in my family to go to college. I was the generation that was like, get there and it'll be good. You'll be safe. You'll be successful. And I got there and I ended up just getting even more fired up and feeling like, holy cow, we should be learning this way earlier on. Right. Um, and then again, that's what really made me turn my focus and around like uh, juvenile justice and like youth empowerment and getting this education to younger folks way earlier and way quicker. Um, and made me realize like, yeah, being such a doer to slow down and like, yeah, I was like, grad school, should I do it? Oh, you hear the narrative of like, oh, like, you know, if you get out of school, it's gonna be so hard to get back in it, but school will be there. And I think really finding your passion and really connecting with people and really um, showing up and being consistent, especially when we're talking about youth, those things are huge. So yes, I think it's important for me in self-education um, and learning experiences outside of my own and learning also how to contextualize my own experience to be that mentor and be that teacher and instructor. But yes and no, I totally agree with that. I think I, I would offer that. Um, I think a lot of the things that I studied really inspired me in terms of how I wanted to be in relationship to the people, the young people that I work with. And also to then create a culture that, that other staff could, could take and, and sort of just a way of, of being in community that was um, informed because there is such a rich literature about those things and about, I mean, Donya mentioned Paulo Freire and Bell Hooks who have written beautifully and like that was so inspiring to me when I, when I, when I came across that, like there is this, that just being in relationship in this way can actually be transformative it, it just that that alone uh as an authority figure being on it on a on a more equal plane and i think sport has the potential to do that in a way that you can't in a regular classroom setting because there's there's a lot less at stake you know i think that's a really important thing like at soccer practice there's a lot less at stake there's really nothing at stake other than fun play all, all these things if, if if you can like divorce yourself enough from wanting to win um, and so you can't you can't actually really authentically do a lot of those things. It, I think it is an ideal place to put that into practice. A lot of those ideas that I think sometimes classroom teachers have a harder time with, um, just because classroom teaching does have all these other kind of rigors and things that are that are associated with that. I've done a little bit of that too. So that's a good question. So one of the the things that have were you did you want to respond? No, no, please. I can add to that. Well, 
I think for me, because I didn't go to school for like community studies or cultural studies. I actually went to school for uh, film and video production. And so on one hand, like I'm, you know, just exposed to mainstream media and then I go to school for independent film production. So all of my professors were actually like not from the world of Hollywood. We were in San Diego, so it was like so close to LA, but they're intentionally chose to like make their careers in San Diego. And a lot of them were documentary filmmakers or from Mexico or from Europe. And through school, I actually got, wow, like there's a whole nother way to tell stories and narratives through film and video production that I just d didn't really have, you know, the awareness of, and especially because back then there wasn't YouTube. Um, so I would say that that definitely lended the opportunity to tell the stories of the female skaters that I was meeting, the female athletes that I grew up with, to be like, there's no reason why they shouldn't have an amazing film that's distributed on a, on a large, you know, platform. So I think for for me for school it actually very much applied directly to um, being able to to be effective in my work later, and then on the same hand I think with um, you know agreeing with what you all are saying, um, we didn't have well I guess maybe we did but I didn't I didn't um, study gender studies in school, um, but because I grew up playing sports you know since I was eight um, and had you know, a, a, just a spectrum of women around me all the time, you know, I understood what it meant, right, for uh, females to feel stereotyped or objectified um, or not even comfortable in their own skin because of the friends I grew up with who maybe came out later as gay. Um, I met, you know, for the first time transgender and non-binary folks inside of skateboarding. So those were things that, um, I know there's amazing classes about that now, but just simply by participating is where I actually understood um, the experience in, in the narrative and could relate to that in like a very real world way. So, yeah. So if you are, I'm, I'm thinking if I wanted to start my own organization, if you all have, have done, what's the advice that you give? Um, the first thing that comes to mind, I'll just talk because I have the mic is, uh, just teamwork. Like there to do it on your own is, so hard and really exhausting. <laughs> um, and so like my advice would just be to start having conversations with the people around you, your friends, you know, you may have different backgrounds, which is actually amazing. Um, but like put together your dream team, you know, um, and start seeing what other people are interested in. Maybe your idea will kind of grow and merge into a larger idea. Um, but really like utilizing community because at, at the end of the day, um, you know, the work we're doing and, and anything actually, um, is just so much more fun with your friends. <laughs> like I invite you to start organizations and start companies and just, I just ever wanted to, all I ever wanted to do was keep hanging out with my friends. And now I've been able to like build companies and build communities and give back with people that I love seeing at work in our events. So, yeah. Yep. I would, I would think critically about it because I think it's, um, I don't know if there really needs to be another organization to achieve what you want to achieve, or could that be achieved by working within an existing an existing structure, I think is, is a really good question to ask. And sometimes the answer might be, no, there is no group that's able to do this thing, and then it does make sense. I'm thinking more in the social sector, like in, in terms of the social sector, as people call it. Um, but but I, I, um, I, I don't know. I think it's... I'm the founder of Soccer Without Borders, and people associate some kind of, uh, there's like a prestige about that that I, I don't feel connected to at all. Like a lot of, it, it, I don't think it's, a, it's not about that. It's, it's not glamorous work, and I think a lot of times people want to start something with some idea that there's like a glamour or um, a shine to it, and it's not that. It's like... Uh, it's just being willing to be to show up and be consistent, and and you know there may be cases where that is is critical to start another entity, but I think a lot of times we can work within existing entities and eliminate a lot of the need for doing your taxes and having a website and doing all that stuff, and you can really focus on the work. Because the hard part for me is I get pulled away from the the thing that I love, which is working with the kids, so often, and almost every founder will tell you that you end up you end up doing a lot of administrative work and writing grants 
and focusing on their website and doing all this type of stuff as opposed to delivering the programs with the young people that you love doing. So it's just important to think about, is that what you want to be doing or do you want to be, you know, what is it that you really want to be doing and how is the best way to achieve that? And starting an organization is one way, but there are a lot of other ways too. So another phrase or word that keeps coming up is this consistency. Um, I, I coach basketball, um, still coach basketball, and my old head, I, I, I did it while I was uh, doing my, my graduate work. My old head, who passed away just a couple years ago at the age of 82, um, Wilt Chamberlain's brother-in-law, like he's a legend in Philly. And one of the things that he said to me first off was, consistency. You better be here every day, right? So why is consistency so important? What is it that folks need to know about consistency? If you're going to do this work, why do they need to know you've got to, you've got to have consistency to start with? Mm, so this made me think about, <clears throat> you can be consistently rude. Um, and so it made me think of like, what type of consistent are you? And I think that there's this interesting play, and I see it with a lot of people who I admire um, in my community. Um, you know, Ben being one of them, I know him personally, um, is the self, ref the, the being consistently self reflective. And that invites me, it reminds me, like, I gotta check myself. Am I consistently checking my words, my behaviors, and my actions? to communicate what I'm actually trying to, you know, when I say I'm trying to do good. Um, and I think that young people see that. Like when you when they see that you're doing the inner work yourself, because we know that sports is not like the solution. There's like certain things in sports that we can weed out, that like we can kind of tease out that are really valuable life skills. Um, and a lot of that is around like being critical, you know, like what, what kind of decision are you making at the buzzer? Um, and how can you apply that to the rest of your life when you have like one split second to make that decision? Um, there is kind of this, yeah. So for me, the, an the answer is like being consistently self-reflective and seeing, you know, just looking at yourself um, because it invites others to do that too. I ju just two stories that happened today. Uh, the first is that there was a young person who, came when he was 15 from Honduras and really struggled, dropped out of high school. Um, this was about three years ago. Uh, got pretty deep into a lot of bad choices and is just about, is, is now becoming a father. He's 18 and he's now kind of becoming a father, sort of a wake up call to him and he came back and we went to Berkeley Adult School this morning for him to enroll in GED and I was sort of the one, like I, he, he played with us for a year. He wasn't, he was one of the 5% of our kids who dropped out and we kind of went off the rails, but he was able to, he was, he was able to find us because we were still there. Like what our, the program is still there. He knew that there would be somebody there he could talk to, to get help, to do something, to get back on track. And then just before I came here, I was like, I thought I was going to be late, but another student who is a graduate, but is now facing homelessness, um, came by the office and was basically like, I don't have a place to go. And like, what, what can, you know, what, how can you help? You know, and again, it's just like being there. Um, if, if Messi were to come tomorrow to our field and there's nothing that he could say that would, that would change uh, Pancho's situation. There's nothing he could say, but the fact that he can come and talk to an adult, that's, that's, that's what the work is, right? Like that there's actually not anything there's not anything that somebody of that stature could say that would that could replace just having having some safe place and some trusted person that is there consistently year in and year out for people regardless of what's going on for them and regardless of what choices they've made because sometimes they make really bad choices okay um i mean consistency for sure for me is everything 10 years ago 2006, I graduated college, and I got into the skateboarding skateboard industry, which was very small at the time. 
And not only was, you know, that small, but women in skateboarding were the least interesting, least popular, least um, economically, you know, viable, like, category of action sports, right? There's, like, men surfing and um, snowboarding and motocross and all these things. And no one cared about women skateboarding. Not only did they not care about it, but they were like, ugh, like, they don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole, right? And so really like those staying consistent, staying true to like my personal interest and my mission, even when my company cut the women's line and they're like, I want you to work on the men's stuff. I was like, "Mm, not interested. Um, But staying on that path is what had me actually um, be able to find like effectiveness and success in making a difference in like marketing women and elevating women's events, skate contests, products, athletes, whatever it is, um, brands. Um, And there's a number of us who stayed in it consistently because we cared. It wasn't because there was money because there was none or fame or anything. In fact, we were like the rejects of the whole, you know, industry. Um, But to continue at it just because we cared and we loved it and it was our community, our friends to this point now where, you know, you have Leticia Buffoni and Lacey Baker who, you know, collectively represent probably the most interesting and influential, um, at least a portion of uh, the the athletes that are signed currently signed by Nike, right? Leticia is like one of the social media most influential and then Lacey is the first non-binary, well, non-binary and just openly um, queer prof- professional females or professional skateboarders period that signed on a Nike. And that just wasn't going to happen. Like none of these athletes could even get a pair of shoes, right? Um, So I would say consistency for sure, you know, when it came to something that maybe you you don't think anyone else cares about, um, but to stay with it because you're passionate and you're committed and you care. Um, And it may not, you know, ever turn into something money-wise, but that's not the reason why, like, we do anything that we're doing, right? And I think in terms of skateboarding, like Ashley spoke to, it is all consistency. Like no one become, no one's naturally. Maybe in other sports, like yeah, you could naturally be like a fast runner. No one is naturally like an amazing skateboarder. You have to try hundreds and hundreds of times to even like you know get the ollie down, right? So I think that's just a, a foundation of skateboarding. Yeah, and just one thing to add on the whole concept of consistency. What really shows up for me is thinking about in the work that we do is really consistently. Um, practicing being human and asking that of our participants. And what I mean by that is that because our organization does a lot of work around gender and gender expression, um, especially uh, this day and age talking about non-binary and uh, what it means to be trans and that kind of language. And a lot of people um, kind of freezing up when we talk about pronouns and feeling not educated or not knowing what all that means. And so really reminding our volunteers, our coaches, our staff, and our participants to be human. And what that is, is for me, especially being someone that's been in higher education, but also being a higher education for my family that don't know how to talk about different isms and stuff, right? And in a sort of elite or articulate way um, is how to sort of um, invite folks to have those conversations and not be so tripped up on looking good in those conversations or being scared to say the wrong thing and to really have those conversations from a place of love and also be okay to be checked in both parties, right? Or all parties involved. So consistency for me shows up that way. Oh yeah. yeah. We're like she's like my Beyonce. Yeah. Oh yeah, totally. Sorry. Say it again. For those of you that don't know, she was the first uh pro uh, female skateboarder. Yeah. She in the nineties. Exactly. She actually lived out in Richmond. Yeah, in SF, yeah. So just in case you didn't hear, the question was, um, are, have we reached out to Alisa, Alicia, Alisa Steamer? Again, she's the first ever female street skater, professional street skater. So yes, she's technically like my Beyonce um, of skateboarding. Um, and yeah, we actually have a huge uh, partnership and just personal relationship um, with her, which I even just get butterflies thinking about it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, she also, um, she has a company called Nard Hunters um, and it's a, com- a com- combination of kind of skate surf lifestyle and clothing and um yeah she's been awesome in terms of being a contributor to the work we do and just showing up in different ways yeah
Hello, <laughs> myself. Uh, no, yeah, I think um, we definitely have examples, even just in like from the beginning of, uh, you know, a one and a half hour clinic, you know, at Town Park to the end of the clinic, you see that like transformation where they come, they're shy, and then by the end they're like screaming and running and like they don't want to go home. Um, and same with summer camp too, right? We're from the beginning to the end. Um, you see that shift, and we've definitely had examples of participants that are that are kind of long long term, where they keep coming back, um, where their parents will tell us, you know, so and so is, um, you know, feeling confident because of what she learned at, at you know the skate lesson on on Sunday, um, and we just see it over time where they go from kind of a, maybe a shyer, more introverted, um, you know person to like they come and they're just like they got their like you know confidence and we're just like is that the same sometimes we're like we gotta check because you know we don't not all of, not everything's rostered we just do open clinics and we're like is that the same girl from like five months ago we're like oh my god that's her and she just it's like a totally different you know experience that she has because she was able to like really have that sense of self-confidence because it, it's so hard. Like skateboarding is so hard when you actually learn something, even if it's tiny, you just get this massive boost of like, I can do anything, you know, so. Um, I would say, yeah, in many different ways. The most obvious one that comes to mind is um, Ben Hameen, who was featured in the film. When he was in high school, this part's not in the film. He had a lot of problems with authority figures, especially like principals and traditional classroom teachers. Um, and he actually was one of the students that worked closest with me with the bureaucratic paperwork of filing a grant, which was we were all learning how to do that at the same time, me with my high school students. And um, we we joke we we I've started a small business. He's also starting started a small business, and we've gotten together to do some of like our tax paperwork together. And um, it's clear that there was something really empowering about that field is built. He drives by it every day, and so he's like, I did that. I could start my own small business. So uh, plug. Oakland Authentic. It's on International and 17th. If you're looking for any Oakland gear, Benjamin Gonzalez started Oakland Authentic. Uh, yeah, I th I, for, for me, I, I think the young people that most come to my mind are the ones that come back to coach and lead the programs. And we even have one full-time staff member who's gone through that process. And um, I think having not only the experiences with the competencies in language, the understanding of what's happening in the internal world of the young people trying to transition from one home to a new home and being able to be fluent in that and also be able to do all the, the programming. It's just, it's amazing to see that happen. And that's just probably the most inspiring thing to me. Um, one other thing that's kind of fun to share, there's a new soccer team, a professional soccer team starting in Oakland this year called Oakland Roots. Um, and the third signing was one of our kids, which was which was super, one of our alumni. Uh, who he's uh, he grew up in Eritrea and uh, was a captain at Holy Names, and um, he's also he's also an entrepreneur. He started his own personal training for for kids with soccer, and just seeing I'm just seeing him. He came out and did a session with our kids yesterday, and was just like so much so much more on it than than like than you know the way that we he was so much stricter with with our kids than than we were. But it's because he you know. He has a different perspective, but it was really cool to, you know, to see that, to see them coming back and, and, and giving back in that way. All right, we got a very real example. <laughs> so Jay, standing here in the back, I'm gonna call it Jay for a second. So perfect example, Jay actually came to one of our events as a participant um, and skated and, you know, did your thing. We're like, oh, like they're a pretty decent skater, that's cool. Um, and then you went home for because school was out and then you came back and it, you were like hey like can I start volunteering and showing up we're like yeah of course um and so just going down the path of you know participant and then volunteering kind of like maybe assisting Ashley with like a kid who was maybe a little shyer or a little you know more focused on the basics to then actually stepping up 
um, to be leading, you know, circles. We do like breakout groups um, to actually just last week, Jay ran a program on their own. So that's like the perfect example of, again, like using, you know, our space and our work to actually impact, you know, life. And I'd imagine that that translates into work and school and your family, right? So it was a close to home example. Yeah, but we'll, we'll take one last question or a comment. Okay. I just want to say you guys are like really amazing. Um, kind of coming from a similar background of high school sports, I didn't have the best peers and I didn't really always know what I wanted to do. And now I'm working with kids in our recreation department and just, you guys open a lot of doors and you're like really good at this. Thank you for your work. And so I've been told I'm, I've got to wrap it up. Um, but one of the other words that I felt came through is this idea of freedom, right? And so, you know, Danya definitely highlighted that. But you get to hear in Skate Like a Girl too, and this this is what we're seeing in the industry of sport. Maybe I shouldn't even use the word industry, but what we're seeing in sport is that kids are are dropping out of these formal sports um, and that participation. Um, really the structure and everything is killing the fun, as they said. Uh, it's a pay-for-play model. People can't afford to do it. It's highly competitive, right? You've got the whole Ricky Bobby, if you ain't first, you're last. So if you're not the superstar, why even do it? Um, but these are wonderful examples of how we are putting the freedom back, the play back, the fun back. Um, even in Soccer Without Borders, it is the opportunity to build community community there. It's creating a safe space that makes it fun again, right? And so you've got this whole level of freedom that we all need to get back and enjoy because what you see, particularly for people of color, is if we don't do it competitively, when we get to that age that we age out of, you know, competition, then we're no longer active like that, right? Unless we are really committed to a community. And so this is an important thing, not only for kids, to be able to have free places to play, but also for us as we get older. Because, you know, when you get to a certain age, you know, you know, those of us who are at that age, you know how, you know, I wish I could just go back and play. I wish my knees didn't hurt, my back didn't hurt. But if we were consistent in playing, one thing I know at 47 is when I struggle going back the first time to play ball again, the more I play, the easier my body takes it. Because that is really our natural state, as Donya said, right? To play, to stand up, not lay down, not sit down for all these hours is really our natural state. So in that you get, not only is it about creating these safe and these space, uh, these safe spaces, and that is about creating better community, battling inequality that's going on at all these levels, right? But it is this consistency too and this commitment to being human that how we are treating these folks, this, these are not stories of how good they became as athletes. These are stories about people and how they were able to make better lives for themselves and how we were able to assist them, right? And so that's what we all, I would say, take away from this, right, is how we get to impact others. And in some ways it is selfish because it makes us feel better, but it is making uh, that better world. So I, I really thank you all for, you know, being being here and, and being able to learn more about what it is you all are doing. I hope that we can find ways to, to work together um, in the future. Thank you all for, for your attention and you know, I want to give an applause. Thank you folks. I'm going to just say a couple things off the back. Thank you Scott. That's such an eloquent way to close the conversation and I, I do feel like it is a conversation and I feel like when I was standing there with Dr. Wright and listening that I wish the conversation could go on for another couple hours. I really don't want to end it. So I'm, I'm thinking of ideas where we don't have to end it going forward. I would love to get this group back together. So watch the space. Um, but before we leave, folks, I, I do want to give a small gift to our, our keynote, Dr. Scott Brooks, um, alumni, that connection. And we are... We, we couldn't find any gear with Cal State Hayward on, so we, we got the East Bay stuff going on. Um, and, I, and I just want to say the last thing is I'm just so proud that the Center for Sport and Social Justice 
and this university um, and our students are, are connected with people like this in the room. It was a very thoughtful uh, discussion, and, and I just love the experience, the wisdom that came out, and, and I'm very serious. I'd love to keep this thing going. Let's keep the fire going, um, and thank you very much. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. about education, but it is those who go before us, they say they've dug these deep wells that we all drink from, right? So Bowser was instrumental to me and helpful, as I'm sure you all are. So, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks. And I will say that, like Ben mentioned, these groups are doing work. They're out in the community. He's doing research. And he was, you know, everyone's been very generous and very open about if you want to reach out to these people, Please do that. They are doing this. They're going to be around, folks. So if you want to get in contact, we can provide you with all the information through our classes, through our networks. But please, again, reach out to these people to do an amazing work in our local communities. Okay? Thank you very much, folks. Have a nice weekend. Take some food, please, especially those chocolate muffins. They don't go home with me. They can't. <laughs>